Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's market commentary. Uh, here we have Freddie with us. Freddie, hi. Hey, Stephanie. Good to see you again. Good to see you. And uh, this week we have a question about tapering from our one of our listeners, uh, Chi Liang Tang. So, like Chi Liang's question is. How Stashway's portfolio is preparing for market volatility from the Fed and ECB bond to purchase tapering and rate hikes. So, Freddie, can you help us with that? Well, first of all, I'm not sure is central bank's objective to generate volatility, uh, and we can see this tendency to avoid volatility in the past. Uh, when in the last many cycles, when they taper or they go into a rate hike, they're very, very careful. And they try to be behind the curve. So remember, a while back, like last year, during the、um, COVID nineteen outburst, the Fed changed its metrics from inflation, spot inflation, to an average inflation, which tells you they're going to be behind the curve and let inflation run a bit more, bringing the average up, and try to just focus more on recovery. Right. So keeping that in mind,、um, in terms of the latest development. There wasn't a very very clear timeline being set of、um, even the timing of a taper, and the definition of the taper. Just want to keep in mind, it's not selling by central banks. It's it's actually buying less.、Mm -hmm. They have already accumulated a lot of assets on their balance sheets, and they're still buying in the, even in the tapering until they stop buying. Then the taper is over. To physically actually become a net seller on the market takes a long time. And the conditions for that, as outlined by Chairman Jerome Powell, has been: while the pandemic is still going on, the Delta Plus variant is a risk.、Um, it's unclear how the economy is going to go. They need to focus on growth. So overall, they're not committing themselves. So I'm not sure it's true the central bank would generate market volatility, and、uh, and the pace is slow. So, however, what Stashway does is we look at. Uh, numbers, asset classes,、um, in the same lens as central bank. That's what ERA has been designed on.、Uh, it's designed to look at the, what central bankers look at in terms of economic information, primarily large number of、uh, data about growth, large number of data about inflation, and we look at the same amount of information in these two dimensions. And that's what guides central bank decisions. And it's also what guides our asset allocation. So overall,、um, I'm not sure what's there to prepare other than sticking to a investment framework that's been there through two trade wars and through the pandemic. It's been there for the last 4.2 years, right? So it's about being consistent and having a plan. So I'll stop here. But more interestingly, I do have a question for you,、uh, Stephanie. Given what I just said about the central banking situations, and I, I tend to get a lot of questions asked about, you know, everything is expensive in the market、yeah. today, and S and P is all, like was all time high couple 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 weeks ago, and and、well, what, what's your view on that? Right? Is there a metric to look at, or、uh, is there any insights for you to share? So I'll, I'll throw、yeah. that at you instead. <laughs> yeah, we also yeah get a lot of questions on on S and P valuations. When people look at valuation, say, I mean, like one common metric is price to earnings, and、uh, IE PE. And if we look at the price to earnings ratio for S and P, it's right now around twenty times, which historically is is actually quite expensive. But also, if we compare the、um, historical range of PEs versus the central bank balance sheet, IE how much money the Fed is printing. Actually, then the high PE start to make a bit of sense, and、uh, we've actually prepared a chart on this,、uh, which I'll, I'll pull up on the on the screen for for everyone to take a look. So here we have the yellow line representing the price to earnings ratio for S and P,、uh, and you can see it fluctuates, but it's、uh, also been trending higher since the central bank started、uh, uh, loosening monetary policy and started printing money from QE one onwards. So the、uh, the white line actually shows you the balance sheet of the central bank. So how much money has been printed, and you can see that there were、um, some、uh, there were some increases historically、uh, when the Fed did the first QE, the second QE, and most recently、uh, you see a huge spike、uh, in 2020 after COVID. That was when the central bank printed a lot of money, and that's when also the yellow line, the PE ratio, shot up as well. So we can see that there were some ranges that the PE has 
like kind of traded uh, uh, within uh, during these different periods post uh, central bank uh, QE programs. From 2008 uh, to 2012, um, for example, like the PE has been ranging uh, between 11 times and 15 times. And from 2012 to 2018, it's been around 15 times to 18 times. Now we're sort of like at a new level because of the massive money printing. And we can see that the range has been around maybe 19 times to 24 times. So if you think about this, uh, what Freddie has said about tapering, the Fed is actually not uh, decreasing the size of the, of the balance sheet. So the balance sheet, I mean, it's just slowing down the purchase. So the balance sheet size would probably stay in, in, in the range where it is today uh, and even go slightly higher despite tapering. So the PE range that we, uh, the S&P would trade at would probably be around the same range that we've seen as well. So if you take that into consideration, yes, I mean, 20 times is quite expensive, but the bottom of that range is probably around 19 times. So for uh, S&P corrections, we're looking at like 5 to 10% uh, if it corrects. And I think that's kind of the framework that you, we can use to think about the question of, oh, is S&P expensive? So an implication for that would be a stable PE. Uh, so it, stable PE means the, the, the way the market value multiples of years of earnings stays the same, let's say. And then it's purely down to earnings. And earnings is purely down to how far we reopen, how far we recover from this whole pandemic. So ultimately, back to fundamentals, um, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the Fed may start to hike interest rates uh, if the economy keeps heating up. But currently, the market is pointing and the Fed is pointing to end of 2022. So it's still quite a long way to go. And end of 2022 for about two hikes? Yep. 225 basis point hike. So, so we're, we're looking at very, very small amount of tightening. Um, yes. Yes. Right. But uh, yeah, uh, hopefully this helps to answer uh, questions um, that Xi Lang has as well. And uh, I think for uh, we have also a few upcoming seminar, uh, webinars, uh, which, are, which covers uh, many different topics. So um, maybe a bit of ad time here. For all regions on September 21st, we have, an, uh, we have actually our CEO, McKelly, uh, talk about the insider's guide to fundraising your startup. On September 21st uh, in Singapore, uh, we have international diversification and FX hedging at 6 p.m. And in Malaysia uh, on, the, on September 22nd, uh, 6 p.m., we have investing basics, and on September 29th, we have how to invest with ETFs uh, the right way at um, 6 p.m. for Malaysia as well. Uh, in the MENA region, on September 23rd, we have the Sashway Money Chat, uh, the future of fintechs in the MENA region. And lastly, on September 23rd for Hong Kong, we have our uh, Ask Me Anything Live in Cantonese at 1.30. So hopefully we'll see a lot of you um, in our different uh, webinars. In, in the next two weeks or so. Uh, great. Thank you. And thank you, Freddie, for uh, answering the questions. And we'll see you all next week. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we have new content out for you. Also, don't forget to download the StashAway app. It's available in the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So you can start on your financial journey right now.